During a career that spanned more than four decades, John Ox trained a host of big race winners around the world, earning universal respect and admiration of racing fans and professionals alike. It is said that actions speak louder than words, and never has it been more apt than when describing the softly spoken Irishman, who always preferred to let his horses do the talking. John, thank you so much for entertaining Stephen uh, and I as we look back on what has, I imagine, uh, been a fabulous career for you to reflect upon. Um, but I'd like to start at the very beginning and, and how you, d you came into the training ranks and how you decided that that was going to be the career for John Ox. Well, my father was a trainer. Um, he bought uh, this site here to build his first stables the year I was born, 1950. <laughs> and um, uh, so I grew up in a racing stable and he was very successful. Uh, you know, he won eight classics and had some very, very good horses. So I was uh, programmed probably from a young age to, uh, to be a trainer. I always wanted to be a trainer. Um, I was always fascinated by it. And, uh, you know, my father was a great reader. He had all the books and all the history and he, you know, got me reading about it from a, a young age. Um, so, um, yeah, I always wanted to be a trainer. Uh, they suggested when I was quite young that I would go to veterinary college and qualify as a vet. They had this idea, you know, if it didn't work out, you'd have something to fall back on. But it never occurred to me that I'd, I'd be falling back on it, you know, it, it wasn't my intention. Uh, just basically, I, I, I enjoyed veterinary college, of course, uh, but it was just uh, a means of learning a bit more stuff, you know, uh, understanding the physiology and the anatomy and all that. So I, I really did veterinary with an eye on training, its value to me as, mm. uh, as a trainer. And what did you pick up from your father? that would identify or help you identify what a good horse would have as their characteristics? Uh, well, I guess I, I, I mean, I could see the good horses that he had. I mean, the, the most good horses stand out a bit. You know, you can, you can see something in them early on. It's sort of their, it's their action and their demeanor and their, uh, the way they approach their work, the way they recover from their work. And, all that so and how they you know react to what you do to them uh, so um, I could see all that growing up um, but very often I'm not so sure how many things you pick up when you're very young I think you know when it's when you start and you you're responsible for the decisions and you're responsible for the mistakes <laughs> then very often you'll think back uh, to what your father did and that certainly was the case. Um, I always uh, tell the story of when I've you know, had young trainers come through here over the years. And uh, I remember one uh, lad who's done very well since in, in another hemisphere. Um, but um, he was going back and he was going to show his father how to do things, you know. He was <laughs> going to bring him into the 21st century and all that. And I said to him, now one thing you need to remember, I said, that when you're 17, you think your father is stupid. When you're 25, he seems to have got a bit more clever. And when you've been training horses for a while and you're 35, you think, God, he was some genius, you know? <laughs> so don't be so hard on your father. And it was a bit like, like me, I think, when, when, you, when you start to do it, you really learn. Mm. And then you start to think about what your father did. Who, who would be or who would be the first good horse or horses that you you trained? I mean, I think you started in, in the 80s. Um, what would be the, the ones that struck you early on, these are good horses, the one that made an impression on you? Uh, you mean my own Your horses? Your own horses. Yeah. Um, started in 1979 and I was a bit up and down for a while until 1986 and uh, had my first really good year and then we went on. From there, I had some good horses. I had a good horse from, for Sheikh Mohammed early on, George Augustus. He was rated about 118. He was quite a nice horse. Not quite a Group 1 horse, but he did win a Group 1 in Germany. Beat Monson, actually, uh, but got disqualified. Mm. He gave him a bit of a bump. 
Um, so he was quite a good horse. But the first one was Ridgewood Pearl, 1995. She was my first real champion, and she was a, you know, an exceptional filly. Uh, very tough and genuine, you know, she was like a colt. Uh, but we have this stereotype of, you know, colts are tougher than fillies. And in actual fact, in my experience, the really, really good fillies are just as tough as the, any colt. And um, so she was my first good one, really good one. We'll obviously talk a lot about her, but I think, Steve, we, so when we were chatting, we were talking about owners as well and the influence. Yeah, so um, your first, I mean, obviously a big big part of your set of connection, you end up with the Arab Khan. Your first major winner that I could find was Mantari, won the national stakes in 1993. How did the connection start with uh, with you and the Arab How did that come about? Um, I started training for him in the autumn of... Uh, in the autumn of... 1987, I got my first yearlings from him. Uh, well, it was his manager here in Ireland at the time, uh, Guy Landrio, was, uh, uh, you know, they had a thriving stud farm, breeding a lot of horses, nothing in training in Ireland, and he was pushing the Aga Khan for a while, you know, it's time you uh, started, because his, his, his father and grandfather had horses in training here in the 50s. But um, before that, but um, so he was he was promoting the idea. So I owe him uh, probably all all that, uh, and uh, they realised that it was and their their operation was getting bigger. They had more horses, so they needed to spread them out a bit more. So that uh, that that's that's what uh, Mr. Dion got to know me because I used to, a lot of breeders, a lot of foreign breeders with mares in Ireland and I used to bring them round show them the stallions so they'd be in um, Ballymany stud as it was then uh, looking at the, the the stallions and all that so I got to know him and he got to know me and uh, he used to ride his hack around with his kids around the curry here and he'd watch me with the horses so he must have liked something so he he, he, he suggested I train for him. In some ways, it was a match made in heaven, isn't it? I mean, if there was a, looking back on your career, a characteristic, I think most people would say that a John Ox, what is typical of a John Ox horse is that they were brought along slowly. You know, they, 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 they got better with age and time and distance, whatever. Um, and that seems to suit a lot of the Aga Khan horses who were, um, he had good two-year-olds, but a lot of them got better with, with middle distances and age. Would that be fair to say? Yes, yes. As you say, he had good two-year-olds and he had good... Milers and he had, you know, he had some sprinters as well. But yes, in general, um, you know, he he was always very patient. He didn't expect a trainer to rush them, and uh, of course that suits most horses if if you've got somebody who's patient owning them. And uh, but you get stereotyped too, don't you? Because you know when you train some of these horses and they do well, uh, people think, oh well, that's the sort of horse we'll send them. But uh, but look at I enjoyed that. I enjoyed given horses time and not been under any pressure and uh, it worked out for us. Mm. Mm. Well, should we get into Ridgewood Pearl. the first of the big ones? Absolutely. Uh, uh, you've already touched on her, Ridgewood Pearl. Just a, a wonderful mm. horse. I mean, we've looked back at some of the videos of her races and mm. just think of her, her ability, her size and everything. I mean, what was the first impression? How long did it take you to find out that she had above average ability? Well, she was smashing looking. To begin with, you know, she was strong. She was, you know, kind of masculine, uh, terrific conformation, lovely action, lovely temperament. So she, you know, as soon as she came into the place, she said, "Gosh, you know, this, this is nice," and uh, she always worked well. Yeah, it was pretty obvious very quickly that she was, you know, potentially very, very smart. And uh, we ran her in. Uh, a listed race first time out at the Curra in September, mid September, and early no early September, and um, I was away with Johnny Murta. We were in Paris. We had a runner in the Prix Vermay, and Christi, Christy Roach rode her at the Curra, beaten a neck. I never saw a film of the race actually, but uh, beaten a neck, hands and heels, bit unlucky. And uh, when I phoned up my assistant for the report, he, he said to me, yeah, Christy says that's the best ho best filly he ever rode. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and Christy wrote, no one was more perceptive, perceptive than Christy wrote. 
But I thought it was a, an amazing statement mm. to make because Christie had written a lot of classic winners at that time. Was that a surprise uh, that he said something like? That? I wasn't surprised, no, mm. because she was. She she looked. I mean, we 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 kind of thought she'd win the listed race first time out. But anyway, she had a nice educational run. He he gave her didn't didn't knock her about. I'm told, <laughs> and um, and then she went and won the Group Three race. Then a few weeks later, six lengths or something. So uh, we knew we had a good one. What sort of at the start of 1995? What sort of plan did you have in mind for how her season would go? Because it was it was an adventurous campaign mm. and it was a bold campaign. Yes, I suppose it was. Looking back, well, we 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 said we'd run her in a classic trial. Uh, and she won the Athesi Stakes, I think it was seven lengths. Uh, we had her in the 1000 in New Market, but I was a bit worried about the ground, the good firm ground, particularly first start of the year. So I didn't run her in it. And uh, ran her at the Curra and she, uh, she bolted in. She went, she went on every ground. At that time I used to wonder, did she just need it soft and mm. would she be not able to handle the other? Uh, but she won that easily and then we took the plunge and uh, went for the Coronation Stakes on good to firm ground. A uh, bit of, you know, walking at the track and all that <laughs> to convince myself it was good enough for her, yeah. which uh, it was. And uh, she broke the track record when she, she won there. So she didn't mind good to firm, even though I wouldn't have liked to run her every day on the good to firm because she was quite a heavy filly. So after that, then we breathed a sigh of relief and, uh, and then decided to think about the autumn and yeah. brought her for the Prix du Moulin. Then uh, timing was quite right and to lead on then to the uh, Queen Elizabeth II stakes at, at, at Ascot and then of course yeah. the Breeders' Cup. But um, yeah, she never let us down. Uh, she was consistent in her work. Her behavior was always impeccable and and then she just had that one blip and the Queen Elizabeth <laughs> stakes well, it was, it. was that a blip it was a famous race for, for Willie Carson going uh, under the, the trees by, him, by himself in soft ground and uh, yeah um, you know, yeah yeah it was uh, yes they'd watered the track and there was some I think a little bit of rain all right um, but um, but Barry was a good horse. You know, Willie, Willie, you see, he made up his mind he couldn't beat her. You know, he had been behind her on the Guineas winner Harry year that mm. and that in, earlier in the Coronation Stakes. So well, there wasn't much between them on the ratings. Mm. Now he, he he was unnecessarily pessimistic, I thought, mm. but he thought he had to do something, uh, and it it worked. What also worked that nobody noticed because I walked the track. And along this, on the rail in the straight, it was uh, a little bit faster than two or three horses out. The sprinter system at that time wasn't the current system. And whatever way, maybe the wind was blowing that day. Right bang along the rail up the straight was a little bit faster uh, than a little bit out mm -hmm. and of course when Willie came angled in at the mm -hmm. turn into the straight he came right up the rail whereas our one was out to try and challenge him and uh, I think that gave him as much of an advantage as mm -hmm. going under the trees because the race before it was the Royal Lodge Stakes and Luca Kumani won it with a horse called Mons mm -hmm. who won by a street he looked mm -hmm. like a champion now, I don't know, I've never spoken to Luca about it, uh, but he didn't do a hell of a lot afterwards yeah. for maybe other reasons. But he was along the rail too, and he, and he, yeah. and he bolted in. So she, Barry might have had a couple of advantages there, but I wouldn't be knocking Barry. He was a, mm -hmm. he was a very good horse, and uh, I didn't really have an ex uh, any other excuse. I could never find anything much wrong with her afterwards. Maybe I thought she looked a little light, walking around the pre-parade ring, uh, a little, little maybe tightened up a little bit too much, but anyway, she bounced back and won the Breeders' Cup. Just, just a bit, yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that was only a month later, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yes, a month, I'd say, yeah. And, uh, yeah, she was, um, she was, she was, 
She was a great one to have. A good traveller, presumably. Yeah, 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 she, yeah. She went everywhere, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, there were, there were no chinks with yeah. her at all. What, what was that experience like at the Breeders' Cup? Because one thing I always find that's enjoyable as a viewer at the Breeders' Cup is when the Americans hone in on a horse that the Europeans believe is a champion and they really give the hype and the build up to it. What was the experience like when you got there with her, a horse who'd obviously achieved as much as she already did at that, to that point of the season? Well, it was a great experience. Um, I'd had uh, just a few runners in America up to that, not many. Uh, she was my first, oh, I'd won, I'd won in Canada with Tim Reed two weeks earlier in the E.P. Taylor Stakes which was, my, I think, my first winner in America. And um, that was a great experience. The Breeders' Cup was a, was a great concept. You know, it's exciting and, and it's great to get that mixture of people. I always enjoyed traveling abroad and meeting trainers from another jurisdiction. You know, you always pick something up from them. And uh, you pick something up when you go to a different environment, different race course. And it was very enjoyable. There was a lot of, yeah, a lot of you know, hullabaloo wasn't there, you know, there always is. And uh, it was just, it was a great experience, I must say, and the owners, uh, the owners enjoyed it a lot. And uh, we were very well looked after. Uh, the International Racing Bureau looked after us very well and organised everything. So it was a great, great occasion. I think, I think the commentator in the Breeders' Cup, Mal, even gave her to England at one point. <laughs> he did, the big English filly, he said, yeah. Well, you see, it was, uh, she had GB behind her name mm. because she was actually foaled in, in, in GB. Yes. So, uh, yes, uh, my countrymen probably were quick to jump <laughs> jump on that. But <laughs> anyway, I didn't care. He could have called her anything he liked, as long as he called her in front. <laughs> Now, I touched on the old car. I was going to say, I thought it was a little period where um, you had a, 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 a horse called Ebediah, mm -hmm. who you did well with, I think, won a couple of listed races, but she turned out a real um, star for you in terms of breeding, because she bred you a Gold Cup winner and an Irish Oaks winner. Um, yes. You know, so that must be, it would be nice to deal with families, I would have thought, in the way that you, you were doing there. You're having that's, that's right. a yeah. constancy. Yeah, oh yeah, no, well, it's always uh, nice to train for breeders because you, you know, you see the same families coming back to you. Yeah, that was e actually Ebezia. Yeah, uh, Ebezia. Yeah, she yeah. won three, uh, three listed races in heavy, heavy, soft or heavy ground. She loved the soft. She needed the soft, and then she she bred as Ebedila, who uh, won the Irish Oaks and the Pre Royal Oak. Uh, ran in the Ark, but it was good to firm. She couldn't handle the soft. Uh, couldn't handle the firm ground. Uh, but she was a different kettle of fish when she went back for the pre-Royal Oak then a few weeks later. And uh, then she bred a Moid Lair winner, Edda Bia, who mm -hmm. was by Rainbow Quest. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of stamina there, but she had class, but she didn't have the best of knees and uh, didn't do anything much at three. And then Enzeli, who won the Gold Cup. Mm -hmm. And then she bred Estimate Absolutely. for the Queen yeah. uh, to win the Gold Cup, which was great. Um, so yeah, she was, uh, she was, she was, she was a nice, a nice mare. Yeah, good, good family. A really good family. Yeah, we're talking about another, another mare, and again, it's really fascinating when we're talking about horses that, you know, after a period of time, you just forget the the breadth of their achievements. And and Tim Arida, oh, yeah, uh, she was a magnificent race mare. I mean, the the, the questions that she w was asked. And the answers she gave so many times were mm. extraordinary. I mean, mm. what was, what's, what's the first thought when you hear the name Tim Arriba? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was as good as Ridgewood Pearl. And I had them both at the same year as three-year-olds. Uh, uh, Tim Arriba just stayed in training when the other one retired. Uh, she didn't have the three-year-old career just operating at the highest level until the end. But yeah, she was... She was, Richard Pearl was bomb proof. She never let us down. She, she was, you know, not, nothing wrong. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to compare the two, but Tim Marita absolutely loved her work. She loved being a racehorse. And she was, uh, of all the horses I ever had, she was the most breathtaking home worker. Mm. She would put her heart into it. She was never tired and she was never putting too much in, but she put plenty into her work. And she was just a machine. 
and uh, she started off in handicaps, uh, won, won, won a, a winner's race on the opening day of the season, had a setback afterwards, to, didn't run till Derby meeting, scraped in in a, in a, in a, a seven furlong handicap at the Curr on Derby day, pulled too hard but still hung on and then she won a big handicap at Galway and then she went into listed mm. races and Grubin went on then and won the Prix de l'Opera. Well, it's a shame because a, a couple of those races that you mentioned, the opera, I think you mentioned the EP Taylor as well, mm. at the time they were group and grade twos, but now obviously they're the highest level, aren't That's they? That's right, yeah. She won the matron stakes at the, at, um, at the, at the Curra, which was at the Curra then. She won yeah. the EP Taylor and the Prix de l'Opera, all, all her races that are upgraded because fillies like her were winning, winning, mm. winning them, you know. Um, so she won seven out of eight. Yeah. She she lost one that year in the Desmond Stakes at the Curra Christie Roach Roller that day. She uh, there's a she running theme here. <laughs> yeah, she threw she threw a, had a splint I think just after that. She had a little something just bothering her, and she only got beaten a neck or half a length. But that was the sort she she was. She yeah. could still <laughs> still nearly win with a little something bothering her. But she was she was marvellous, all right, and. Uh, she won in five different countries as well. I said, again, it was amazingly versatile on all yeah. on ground officially yeah. ranging from firm in yeah. America yeah. to heavy. Yeah, and she was a tremendously. Oh yeah, well, yeah, I yeah. Mean, she she could do anything. Yeah. yeah, she was just a little bit too keen for her own good. She used to pull a little bit, and uh, that was that 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 uh, worried us for a while. Uh, she was just so enthusiastic. And uh, then, as a as a four year old, after uh, she pulled too hard in the Queen Anne, mm. she actually bled because of it, uh, which she never did, never did subsequently either. But she did it that day, and um, maybe my horses, my horses might have been a little a bit off form or something, and that might have contributed to it. So she she didn't start the year well, but then she went on. She won in Germany, Group mm. One, and and. Uh, the Beverly D mm. in Arlington, which she was very impressive there. Terrific, eight Group One winners in the race, and yeah. she just bolted in. And then the Champion Stakes at Leopardstown, and um, and then we ran her in the Champion Stakes at Newmarket behind Basra Sham and Halling, and she was third. She'd had a temperature a week before the race, and. Her Gosh, you know, that's her out. But she seemed to recover quite quickly. I think it might have given her a kind of a short-acting anti antibiotic. Her bloods came right, and she was fresh, and everything we ran her. But you know, she ran a good race. She was mm. only beaten uh, head by Halling for second. Basra Sham was a great filly, but you know, um, she hardly ran her best that mm. day. You know. I would have loved to have kept her in training as a five-year-old, but the Aga Khan didn't really do that, yeah. you know. <laughs> he yeah. reckoned he'd seen enough, I suppose, but I'd have loved to have had her because, you know, those great fillies, a lot of them, they last longer than colts. Yeah. Colts get, you know, they want to go to stud, you know, they yeah. get, uh, they, 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 they're a little harder, some of them, to, to keep at a high level when you get on beyond five. But you get... Uh, or at five or older, I suppose I should say, but you get a filly that's really good and likes their work, as she did. She just loved being around. I'd say she was disappointed when she was let out into a field, <laughs> you know? She'd be unusual, but she loved training, and she loved being a racehorse, and she'd have been a very good five-year-old. There was certainly a lot left in her. Mm. Was there one race through her career that that really stood out? Because there were a number of game victories, but there were also some impressive ones as well. Is there one that, that stood out to sort of characterised the things that made Timurida Timurida? Well, she was terrific in the opera at Longchamp. Uh, as a three-year-old, she settled right in behind and then just flew past them and just streaked away five lengths. And in the E.P. Taylor, something the same. Frankie rode her there, actually. Johnny couldn't do the weight. And... Uh, Similar thing, it's just you know behind the leaders, and she just streaked away, won by you know a good and wide margin into a 60 mile an hour uh, 
a headwind or a, st a storm, you know, mm -hmm. and she just poof, cut into it and finished finished very strongly. They're, they're, they're the two, uh, plus also, I suppose, the Beverly D. There were, there were three where she was really mm -hmm. impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd take your, she'd take your breath away. And they were the two best fillies I had. I had them in the same year as yeah. three-year-olds. I never had another, <laughs> never had another one as good. Uh, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't probably really expect to. There, there was a spell of, of obviously those two fillies outstanding. There was also Ebba Dyler, uh, who came along in the 90s mm -hmm. as well. And she was very good as a two-year-old and came back the following season. Uh, and she was one of the progeny of Ebba Zaya, who you, you touched on. I mean, uh, there was Anzeli, Ebba Dyler, Estimate, Edabaya, etc. There, there are mm. more. Other, there are other black types, mm. uh, black mm. type performers mm. in there. But was there something in? Obviously, stamina is one of the things. But was mm. there something in their makeup and their characteristics that you, that you saw with Ebazaya that that was mm. transferred to the progeny? Well, the dam there, Ebazaya was it was a lovely looking filly. She was a beautiful model. She was what you call a, a nice square model. You know, she wasn't big and rangy. She was really well put together, strong medium size, beautiful conformation, very good temperament. Except she was a box walker and she had a goat as a companion. And Ebedila was the same, she was a box walker. Right. Now they were lovely temperament, they took their work well, but they just were box walkers. So we had, this, I think we probably had the same goat still in the place, <laughs> had, had a couple of, had a couple of uh, projects in the meantime, but then she was still there uh, for her daughter. And, um, uh, but you know, even though that's considered a flaw in their case, it didn't bother them. They were calm, uh, good natured horses and, uh, uh, very good. So, uh, but that was, that was the surprising thing that they were both box walkers, but, uh, they were just nice models. They were nice racing models. They had good confirmation. And Saki hold them off. Sindar laying it down a strong challenge. The Irishman beat on over the far rail. It's Saki reeled in by Sindar. And Sindar's stamina comes to the fore from Saki. It's Sindar and Johnny Murta for Ireland. Sindar wins the Motorco Derby. We often say it must be lovely for so-and-so to train the progeny of a horse that they want to train. But there was a horse called Sintara that you trained. She was a very good, very good filly. Uh, and she went on to produce Sindar, who I know uh, Steve feels one of the most underrated. Yeah, I think in, in recent times, I think I thought think his three-year-old career was, you know, was, was really terrific, and he was getting better and better. And I thought his art win was a, was was marvellous. Mm. Ah, he was. Yeah, he was. He was a terrific horse. Um, his he kept improving. You yeah. see, you know, he was, and he was an ordinary worker at home. Uh, you know, Johnny Murty used to ride him a lot, and he said, "Oh, this fellow's going well." Standing on the ground, you wouldn't see that because he, he you know, you, he, he would work just alongside an ordinary horse. In fact, his main working companion was a low-grade handicapper, mm. but it, it was enough. You know, he did enough, and uh, um, he kept improving. His Derby win at Epsom mm. was uh, terrific. He beat Sack Sacky, yeah. you know, and we all yeah. know what a good horse he was. Yeah. But everything else. Beat Hollow, I think, was third. He was very, you know, did mm -hmm. very well in America afterwards, and right down to the sixth, seventh, eighth horses. They were all horses who achieved a lot subsequently. So it was one of those great derby fo derbies, really, in terms of depth, depth of the opposition, and uh, and then in the arc. Uh, I mean, he just kept improving every time he ran. He was five pounds better than the previous time. Ended up with a rating of I don't know what was it 132 or three. He what, wasn't yeah. flash, was he? You know, he was he was no. he's a horse who found and mm. you know what, what you ask he gave sort of thing. Yeah, just did enough. Another one of those. He just did enough. And uh, and Johnny used to say, you know, I, I, this this fellow I don't, just don't know how much mm. the more there's there because there's certainly there's cer certainly plenty. Um, you wouldn't have known what, what else he could have achieved. And his, his three-year-old campaign was, was textbook. Mm, it you know, was. There, was the, there was the first run that got him into the sink, then he won his trial, he won the, the derby, he won the Irish derby, then you gave him that, that break before bringing him back for the Niel and the Arc. That's sort of three-year-old campaign that you would almost, you know, you'd write it down at the start of the season, this is my ideal. I suppose so, yes. Uh, 
uh, you know, he did he did well as a two-year-old, uh, winning the national stakes. He didn't look to me like a horse who'd win the Derby. I thought this is a, a nice horse here. I'd say this will run a place in the Derby. Um, it wasn't a super field in the national stakes, um, but uh, he was an inexperienced horse, so he did well to win. But I did think then when he got beaten on his first start. Mm as a three-year-old in the Bally Sacks, beaten by a fit horse of Dermot Wells, giving him seven pounds. I said to myself, oh, hold on a minute here now, this fellow could be a winner in the Derby. And then he stepped up, gave seven pounds to back in the Der Derby trial, beat him a head or something, but gave him seven pounds back, was just beaten a head in the Eclipse Stakes the following year, had won the Guineas trial a few weeks earlier at Leopardstown. So every time he ran, that was a remarkable thing about him, every time he ran he was five to seven times, time, pounds better than the previous time. Um, so, um, yeah, he was, he was such a pleasure to train to, such a quiet horse, you know, anyone would ride him out. Your granny would have ridden him out sort of in the first half of the year, but then as the year went on, you know, he started to get you know, stronger, more full of himself, and you had to watch him by the end. He could throw a jump and a kick, and something he'd never have done earlier, you know. So he had a fabulous temperament, and a uh, good-looking horse, but tough, 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 and that's what you find out, you know. That was when, that was the first sort of real, well, apart from Ridgewood Pearl, but, you know, y you learn something from those horses, and I found out that, you know, Training horses for the classics that say win the national stakes or the Burris for stakes or something like that, training them through the winter, working them from early in the spring, getting them ready for the classics. Uh, it showed me that they have to be different. They have to be really tough, sound in limb, but sound in mind, and uh, they have to enjoy their work. And they, they really can't put a foot wrong if they're going to meet those targets. Early, what's what's in what's mm. early in the year, mm. so um, then I realised then that those horses were different and had to be different to the rest. Mm. And just before we move on to any other horses, the fact is that he gave you a, a Derby winner at Epsom, and there's obviously a great deal of satisfaction in winning all the other Group Ones, but a Derby winner and an Arc winner, the same horse. I mean, for for anyone involved in the sport, I, I imagine that's close to the very top. What was what was it like to finally get your hands on those two? Yeah, yeah. I sure look at it, it was a, a bit of a dream, isn't it? I mean, the Ep Epsom was, uh, you know, you, you get stunned when you win at Epsom. Uh, I'm sure Michael Stout is blue in the face winning the Epsom <laughs> Derby. He's not stunned anymore. But but my first one, uh, yeah, it was, it was, gosh, you know, has this really happened? Have we actually won the Derby, you know? It was uh, a terrific uh, feeling, and uh, and then a relief, of course, with so much expectation for the arc, a great relief. Then, when he went and did, what we do when he won the Niel, we thought, God, you know, he was it was the first time. I know he beat he didn't beat classic horses, I suppose, but he won by a wide margin, mm -hmm. eight lengths or something on the bridle, just sprinted away. He looked different than he had in other races. He looked sharp, and he looked. He looked, uh, he looked like he was improving, which he was. And uh, we went home there. Um, you know, I remember meeting Andre Fab as I was walking out, and he said, "Oh, I think we saw your your dark winner today," uh, because that's the impression he created that day. And uh, um, so we had high hopes, even with Monjo in the race, we had high hopes that he'd win. We're going to move on and talk about another couple of Aga Khan-owned Colts, both starting with the letter A. Both horses I know Steve a huge fan of. Uh, a Lamshaw would be the first one you wanted to... Yeah, again, it's a, a couple of things. That, you know, I think the only horse who ever beat Dalakani and won a really good King George. Uh, you know, it was eight or nine Group 1 winners in the race. So what's your memory of Alam Shah? Yeah, fond memories of Alam Shah. He was a really good horse. You know, it takes a lot for a horse to break the 130 rating barrier. And he was uh, rated 131. Dalekani, I think, was 132 uh, that year. But yeah, he was, a, he was a lovely horse. He wasn't big. He was only 15'2". So he looked a bit insignificant, maybe, in the parade ring along with others. But when you stood him out in the yard uh, with no tack on him and everything and just looked at him, he was actually a really well-made horse, good-looking horse. 
and uh, um, he was by an unfashionable stallion who did quite well, a key of luck. Uh, but we didn't have any particular hopes for him, and I ran him in Listowel as a two-year-old. Remember, the ground was firm, but he had legs like iron, and I said, oh, this fellow will go on it, and he won easily. And then he won the Barris for Stakes, be Brian Baru. Mm. Uh, so we thought, gosh, we have a good horse here. And uh, he ran the Bally Sacks again, the usual thing. And um, Aidan had a uh, hot favourite, ridden by Michael Canaan, and Johnny was tracking him. But both of them, well, I think Johnny in particular, uh, didn't notice or didn't realise that Aidan's pacemaker had gone so far in front, uh, he, he went beyond rec recall. And of course, Michael's fellow didn't run up to form, mm. wasn't able to go with him. And then Johnny was too far, too far back. But he let him go in the straight when he had an impossible task. And he flew up the straight and he was second, mm. but he really caught the eye and he went past the line, 100 miles an hour. Uh, so then I think he went favoured for the derby at that stage. And uh, he got home on soft, soft ground in the, in the derby trial, beating Brian Baru again. Um, and we thought we had a good chance in the derby. But he was a small horse, uh, as I said, and very often small horses get intimidated by bigger ones around them. And in the derby, it was 23 runners, a big, big field. He didn't travel like he, he had traveled in his previous races. And you know, you couldn't have fancied him turning into the straight. But when he got out, got him out a little bit where there was nothing much around him, he really finished strongly. And he was beaten a length or something. Chris Kinn got a bit of a lucky run up the inside. <laughs> Fallon got him through a very narrow gap. If he hadn't got him through the gap, he wouldn't have been in the first five, probably, you know. But um, he, he won the race with that manoeuvre, and our fellow, um, we were disappointed because you know, he just he didn't look as sharp as previously, but that's all it was. He, he, he didn't like the big crowd around him. Subsequent events showed us that. Uh, so. His Highness had Dalakani, won the French Derby the previous, the following day. He was their big hope uh, because he was, because of his pedigree, a son of Darshan and everything, he was the big hope to be a stallion for them rather than our fellow. And uh, there was a bit of discussion uh, um, and uh, about whether Alam Shah now, who had just been beaten, would, would run against Dalakani. But the Aga Khan, and I'll always be grateful to him for it, he, he, he said, well, look, at this is the current, it's the Irish Derby, it's in John's backyard, it's his derby, let him run Alan Shar as well. And of course, you know, he beat Dalek Um But what I didn't realise, that, that actually our fellow needed a little ease in the ground. He needed, um, it wasn't as good, because he won as a two-year-old on firm ground, I thought this fellow would go on the Tarmac Adam Road, but um, he was better with the little ease in the ground, which we had that day, and he ran a hell of a race to beat Dalakani. I think if Christoph Sumiyama was riding the race again, he wouldn't have gone to the front so soon. He was a perfect target for our fellow. But look, it, it was no fluke, as you say, the, the King George was a hell of a field. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking back at I, I, when we talked about it yesterday. We were looking back at the field last night. And I just Tremendous. wanted to go through it. Suleimani was second. Mm. Kriskin, the Derby winner, was third. Bol and Eric, a Ledger winner, in fourth. Falbrav, one of the best older horses around. Uh, Warsan, who was a Group One winner, Coronation Cup. Nayef, mm. uh, multiple Group One Ledger winner, Millenary. There was the South African champion, Victory Moon, mm. and Grandira, who was also a high-class yeah. Group yes. One. Horse. He was yeah. he was back in eleventh. It was one of the yeah. best fields. Yes, in, in depth. and he yeah. and he was he was dominant. Yeah, he was. He was again. We had a little bit of rain, you know, and and uh, and Johnny had him. Uh, he had him in, in the Irish Derby on the outside of the field, coming down the hill. He wasn't boxed up, and same at Ascot. He had him up third or so, up with the pace, just a little bit on the outside. He had no horses around him. And so he wasn't intimidated, and he absolutely flew that day. Yeah, it was a terrific, terrific win. 
And then we ran them in the champion stakes, a really good champion stakes at Leopardstown. Mm. High Sharp Rugby, Islington and Falbrav, controversial race. The MJK managed to get everybody into trouble except <laughs> himself. Uh, but he was sort of leaning on our fellow around who was on the rail, big horse. I'd be sat in a link on our fellow, although he was favoured, he just wasn't as happy uh, yeah. in that confined space and uh, he was, I think, fifth, bunched finish, nothing in it. He still actually recorded a very high rating for his fifth there, but he didn't show his, his best, you know. And then in the arc, we had him, declare, uh, had him in up to the last minute, but um, I, we weren't allowed to run him against Dalekani in the arc, which was fair enough. We had we had, had our day against Dalekani, and uh, he, he was really travelling well at that time, working well. He'd have gone very well in it, but anyway, that was Dalekani's day. And then we ran him and stayed in the champion stakes at Newmarket, good to firm ground, and he, he, he didn't like it. Mm. And that was the end. He went to Japan as a stallion then. But he was a good horse, quite tricky, uh, with a lot of little back issues with him. He was he, We won the Irish Derby because of a chiropractor who uh, he couldn't... Uh, he couldn't walk straight the two days before the race. He, instead of walking a straight line up the yard, he walked, walked like that. And uh, he had a torsion of the sacrum, my physio, Liz Kent, said. And uh, she said, I can get that right if you give me a week or 10 days, but not, not before the Irish Derby on Saturday. So we just got called the chiropractor in France, Marc Baudou, who used to come to me once a month. Going, you better get on a plane and come over here. And he came, the derby was on a Sunday. He came on Saturday morning and uh, he just felt him and then he lifted up uh, one hind leg and pulled it up towards his shoulder. He went around the other side and he pulled up the other one and he pulled it back and uh, felt him. He said, yeah, I think he's okay. Bring him out and walk him. And, you know, he went from walking like that 10 minutes earlier to walking straight up the yard oh. and he was we rode him out afterwards who's his chiropractor might go and see him myself yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, i owe him the irish derby you know yeah 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 but he was a little tricky like that he had a few little issues like that oh. and uh, only for the help we had uh, he might not have achieved what he did you didn't have to wait long another hopeful to mention which is a beginning with a but yeah asimore who, I th if you were, if you were going to write a textbook about how a horse would develop, you know, we were touching that earlier. I thought Adam really was that the good two-year-old developed into a very good three-year-old, and with distance and age and developing, he went from a, he was a mile winner at three, and then obviously a mile half at four. Mm. I would have thought that would that would have given you a lot of pleasure. It was a it was a I think a textbook career. Yes, he was, he was a pleasure to have. I really had a, fo a soft spot for him. Mind you, you have a soft spot for all the good ones, don't you? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd have a lot of soft spots, I suppose, <laughs> luckily enough. Mm. But uh, yeah, he was. He was a big horse, um, uh, a big two-year-old. Um, you know, so he needed a bit of time, but he had an engine, won his maiden, won the Beresford mm -hmm. Stakes. And, uh, but yes, he developed. He, he was one that showed enormous physical development. Uh, through his three-year-old year and uh, put on was a lot heavier by the end of the year than he was at the beginning and uh, and also he got he improved he was a little probably a bit weak at the start and he couldn't handle soft ground very well um, but he had a very good three-year-old career around he was a terrific battler you know he was a really honest reliable horse um, but he was unfortunate that uh, he went for the guineas in Newmarket one, the one year that it rained. And Haft, who was a very good horse in the soft, uh, won. We were third. I don't know how he got beaten in the Irish guineas for some reason. Uh, Bachelor Duke travelled, tra challenged very wide. And whether he didn't see him or you know, wasn't stimulated enough, he beat him fair and square. But, but um, that was a race... Uh, you know, if it was run again, you might have had a different result, maybe not. But um, 
uh, we, that was because of that that we didn't aim a Michael Canal and always said, you know, this fellow will stay a mile and a half, the Derby, you know, it's there, there for him. But uh, because he had lost the 2,000 guineas of the Curra, uh, we had to go for the St. James's Palace, which he won. Um, and that was considered more commercial by the Aga Khan's breeding advisors. So that's the way we went. And he won the Irish Champion Stakes, and uh, um, and soft ground again. And then we went to the Champion Stakes. We said, "Oh, we 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 get our ground this time. It couldn't be, it couldn't possibly be soft two <laughs> twice in the one year at Newmarket, could it? <laughs> but it was, and half to one again, yeah. uh, and he, he finished third. But we didn't mind running him on it. He he wasn't at his best, but he uh, he could handle it." But then as a four-year-old, when he strengthened up with all that you know, mm. extra maturity, I don't think ground really mattered. You know? But yeah, he had a great year then, uh, unlucky in the Rogers Tattersall's Gold Cup, and then winning the Prince of Wales Stakes. Mm. He went from winning races on the big long straights to going to Belmont, which mm. I know is a big track by American standards, but it's a short, it's a short straight and uh, he got into a bit of trouble in a bad position and flew home and was third to Scirocco. Um, I don't dwell on disappointments much at all, but if I had to name one race that got away, one big important race, it was, it was that. I was kind of sorry for the horse because I wanted him to go out. He was such a terrific horse for us that, um, uh, you know, I would have liked him to have gone out by winning the Breeders' Cup, which I think he would have deserved, you know. But he was another horse with a great temperament, uh, an alpha male, Colt, you know, who would, if he was in the wild, he'd have, you know, he'd have killed all the other stallions and been the boss, you know. That was, that was the way with him. He, he was, and he trained to a different beat. You could, you don't train all the horses the same. Him, he, in his case, you could work him harder, keep him in a tougher regime, and he thrived on it. And he, he, you know, he made physical development, but he got tougher and stronger all the time. And uh, uh, learned a lot training him, and uh, uh, really had a great fondness for him. They race towards the final furlong, Delegator and see the stars. Evasive is third, then Ganaraz, Rip Van Winkle stays on. Well inside the final furlong, see the stars on the near side for Mick Canan from Delegator. And see the stars wins a fourth guineas for Mick Canan. Golden Sword on the front end, Leeds passing the two, see the stars in the yellow colours, and Fame and Glory are out after the leader, then Age of Aquarius, Rip Van Winkle, Golden Sword being gathered in by see the stars, now the stamina questions will be answered, inside the final furlong, see the stars, from Fame and Glory, Rip Van Winkle, late on the scene down the outside, see the stars will complete the guineas, and Derby double, see the stars won the Investec Derby. See the stars will have to dig in. Rip Van Winkle, his old rival, is closing up on the Guineas and Derby winner inside the final furlong. See the stars by half a length to Rip Van Winkle. He's beating off Rip Van Winkle. They race up to the line. See the stars, this shining star. See the stars wins the eclipse. Murta gets to work. He says, go on, Master Craftsman. Can he shake off? See the stars. Mick Canan begins to push away in second place on the Derby winner. There's a length and a half between them. They race down to the final furlong. Master Craftsman, see the stars now challenging on the near side. The gap down to half a length. And Nick, see the stars beginning to get up on the near side. Oh, every inch a champion and a fabulous four-timer. See the stars wins the Jump Pont International. Well, we've spoken about a lot of very, very good horses so far, John, um, and enough horses at that highest level that a lot of people would have been very happy to have reflected upon and say, I've had a great career. But we are yet to talk about a horse that transcended beyond all those that we've mentioned before. And I'm actually, you know, just even talking about him gets me emotional because he is one of the great horses of all time, see the stars, that so many racing fans were privileged to see for obviously his two-year-old season but the three-year-old season and I had a little sneaky peek at one of the pictures that was just around the corner there and just seeing the races that he won oh. in black and white still just hits you in the face 
when I say the name See the Stars, what, what's, what's going through your mind? I sure look at it was just a miracle, wasn't it? You know, that uh, uh, any, any trainer could, uh, you know, we, we, we got a lot of horses from breeders over the years, uh, but we never got too many horses from the sales. We never got a lot of expensive horses. But we were lucky, we had good owners who sent us nice horses and they did very well. But uh, to have a horse like him walk through your gate uh, just by chance, uh, uh, the owner, uh, uh, Christopher Choi and his mother, uh, had sent me a coat the previous year, half-brother by Green Desert, and he had a lot of little things wrong with him. Uh, and I knew from the beginning, from early on, he wasn't going to do anything. And then, lo and behold, I got a call from John Clark, who was the manager of the National Stud. Uh, we've got a Cape Cross call down here, Mrs. Choi wants you to, to look at him. And I thought to myself, having had the brother the previous year that was so such a disappointment, I said, my God, why don't they sell that horse? You know, he'd top the sale, he'd, be, he'd, make, he'd make seven figures, he'd be the most expensive yearling. Now, I didn't say it to anyone else, only myself. <laughs> uh, and uh, I said, God, aren't they brave to sell? And he was a beautiful looking horse. You know, he'd have, he'd have topped the sales. So, you know, to have the owners brave enough to put another fellow into training mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, the, with, with his brother not too promising uh, was great bit of luck for us, great bit of luck for them. Fortune favoured the brave. But um, so it was a miracle, really, that we could have a horse like that and that he could achieve all that. I mean, it was just after it all was finished, I said to myself, my God, imagine that. Imagine having a horse like that, you know, and that everything, you know, that he could win everything, which we, we set him out to do, you know, when we, because we knew once he'd won the guineas that, um, which is a really important race for him to win, mm. uh, prove that he had plenty of speed, but then the guineas in the derby, you know, that was always, for me growing up, that was the holy grail. If you had a, a horse who could win the guineas and then a month later, four weeks later, win the derby, 50% longer distance, completely different track, um, that, that, that was it, you know. So when he, when he did the two, we knew, we knew he, and we, knowing the horse, the way he was built and the temperament of him and the physical and mm. physical and mental qualities that he had, we knew we could take on, really ask him the questions and, and that he had the ability to win up, win, win all those big races and run up a sequence because he had to run up a sequence if he was really going to be one of the greats. You know, it's not just one big performance or maybe two, you have to have a lot of them. Can I just ask you there, you're just saying if he was going to be one of the greats, what, what point are you thinking that he might be one of the greats? When did you start feeling that? Well, when he won the derby after the guineas, you see, that was the, the big thing. Can you do that? And Mick said it to me in the number one, you know. You know, it, it, still, I, I <laughs> it still makes me emotional to think of it, but that's what he said. He said, this is one of the greats. And... Um, we didn't say it at the time, you know, there's no point saying, oh, this is one of the greats when he's just, just won, you know, it's June, you know, there's a lot more to go. Uh, so you have to, you have to uh, hold your tongue and, and then make him into one of the greats, let him, let him display his ability. So all we needed was just to keep him right, not make a mess of him uh, and avoid bad luck. And that at the end of the day is what you're so grateful for at the end, mm -hmm. that you know, he didn't stand on a stone on the wrong day or didn't get sick or whatever. He'd already been sick before the guineas. Of course, he had a high temperature, 103, on the 17th of March, quite close to the guineas. Only he could win the guineas after a, a viral infection uh, so close to the, close to the race. But uh, maybe that helped give him a bit more immunity maybe for the rest of the year because he was very healthy. And, um, and then he... And you know, funny things happen. Uh, he didn't. We had to take him out of the Irish Derby because the weather changed, and we mm. had it in my head he, he he mightn't like soft ground. But it was a blessing then because he went to Sandown the following week. 
he met completely different horses mm -hmm. and uh, broke the track record and, and beat Rip Van Winkle who won the Sussex Stakes mm -hmm. and was uh, a few lengths on his next start and he, um, he beat four-year-olds, Conduit I think was third and he won the King George mm -hmm. in the Breeders' Cup afterwards. So that worked out well for us and he got his ground all through. I had this idea that he, he, he liked fast ground because I saw a statistic that spring that Cape Cross's stock, uh, uh, there was a higher winners to runners ratio when the ground was good to firm than when it was softer than that. And, and there was one bit of work a uh, week before the Guineas where he just didn't quite work as well as other times. But I think that was, looking back on it, might have been the softer ground that he worked on. It might have been the fact that he still wasn't quite sparkling after his temperature. And just with the week of the race, he just blossomed and he sparkled in his final blowout on the Thursday before the Guineas. And we, we knew we were on our way to Newmarket after that. He, he took on all comers, didn't he? I did, I did a little aside, I was counting up, my math might be wrong. Aidan ran 11 different horses against him. Like, yeah, I mean, some good ones, some really good ones. Fame and Glory, Rip Van Winkle, you mentioned, Master Craftsman, they're really good horses, they're own right. And they threw, they did, and everyone, everyone else threw everything at him in the course of the season. Mm -hmm. And it was same old, same old. All of a sudden, just used to repel them with sort of, not with disdain, but with, with comfort. Ah yes, he, he was never uh, he was never fully extended in any race, even though it might have looked like he it might have looked like he was. But uh, no, he always had plenty. Really smart horse, yeah. really intelligent horse. You know, he, he he used to look about him a lot out at exercise. He'd be notes and everything, as Mick Kessler used to say. You know, we've sheep on the curve here, here, and he used to say, "God, if there are three sheep missing now, he'll know he'll notice <laughs> it." <laughs> but. Um, mm. Um, he, uh, he, he was too smart to uh, win by too far, you know, but um, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was him. He always had a lot left in the tank um, and uh, York, it, it was a bit of a funny race and that he... I was worried for him, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah because he, he went through the gap to follow Johnny. Aidan always had a plan, it was always it a did. good clean plan, yeah. you know, but he always had a plan to try and beat him and Johnny Murta has told me since, you know, there were days when they were sure they were going to be because Master Craftsman was flying before York and <laughs> Fame and Glory was flying before Leopardstown. <laughs> but um, uh, he, he got, the horse for once got a little confused at York because he quickened up to be on Master Craftsman's tail when, the, when he went through the gap and then he kind of settled again, you know. So then when you ask a horse twice, it can be a little slow to respond the second time. Mm. So he was kind of, got, he had gone to sleep a little bit again, the second time and then he, but Mick said to me in the winner's enclosure that day, he said, he'd come on for the run, he had a little, little bit oh. of a blow. Uh, and of course then, uh, 18 days later, there was a shorter gap between York and Leperstone. Leperstone was a week earlier than it is now. And, uh, in the 18 days, he he improved a lot. Of course, again he he beat uh, Master Craftsman by much further. But um, yeah, he always had a lot left, and I suppose uh, Michael Canan has spoken about it uh, since then when he won the Ark. He said uh, Sumion came up alongside him to congratulate him when they were pulling up and. See the stars thought, oh God, maybe the race isn't over yet. <laughs> and he took off. He said he went way down the back straight. He couldn't pull him up. And he said he had never ridden a horse who had put in a big effort in a group one race that had so much energy left in him when he went past the winning post. You know? mm. So that was, you know, that was, that was see the stars. The, the art performance, I still look back on and think it is extraordinary because I don't think he really settled as well, I imagine, I mean, you, you can tell me, I don't think he settled as well as you or Mick would have wanted in the early part of the race. Then he gets caught in that pocket, mm. turning into the straight. You know, Jim McGraw's commentary where he says, you know, he'll have to be a champion mm. to win the race today. That mm. remains mm. One, of the, one of the great moments in, mm. in racing history. Yes, he, he, he didn't appear to settle. Uh, see, we were always very lucky. Um, we didn't have a pacemaker for him. 
but Aidan O'Brien gave us, gave us the pacemakers. He always had pacemakers. I mean, he broke two track records at York and at Sandown with Aidan's help. Um, I think Aidan had this idea that, uh, you know, we'll have to get try and get this horse off the bridle. We'll have to make the pace as fast as we can. But that suited us perfectly. You couldn't get see the stars off the bridle. No horse could get him. You know, he just, he just had all those gears and uh, uh, you could never get him off the bridle, but he was a very enthusiastic horse. Uh, he wasn't a puller mm. by nature. He didn't pull, very relaxed at home and all that. But when the gates opened, he wanted to hey, let me at them. You know, he was aggressive and he was a competitor. And, and so every time before that, there was nice pace. Uh, in the arc, for some reason, the first furlong was a little bit slow. And it looked, and I was worried for the first time in my life, I was a bit alarmed. Oh God, he's, the, me, me. the one thing I worried about was that would he, would he be keen if, you know, he, would he be over enthusiastic? And he was there for a while, although Mick said to me afterwards, it probably was worse than it looked, but he had to get him back. Yeah. He had to anchor him back. So he wasn't in the position we envisaged he'd be in. Uh, and uh, I was a bit concerned turning into the straight, even though the main dangers weren't that far in front of him. But I was worried that he looked like, as you said, in a pocket. And Getaway was in front of him. Mm. And I was mightily relieved when he, uh, he looped around Getaway. They were both going for the same gap, but Getaway was in front of him. So he had to pass him out before they, they got to the gap, which he did. I think Olivia Pellier got a, quite a surprise, uh, he told Mick afterwards, when he just flew past him and he got to the gap first. And when I saw him get through that gap, I said, no, he's okay now. If it's, if it's okay, I'm just going to do a personal indulgence because I had the pleasure of coming to interview you uh, for the BBC in 2009, before the arc. Mm -hmm. And there were two things that struck me uh, a, a great deal. One was watching See the Stars walk to the gallops and back and obviously there's public areas and there were there were kids on quad bikes and you, know, you mentioned the sheep etc. There's lots going on but he was very relaxed, very calm. I remember when he was coming back uh, the, the, the chap who rode him out had legs out the irons, long rain, not a bother on him. That was the first thing. The other thing that struck me was when I was interviewing you and I asked you about the, the special feelings or the specialty about training the horse, you became very emotional then, even before the arc. And I, I've remembered that moment as one of the most sort of significant ones in, in my time in racing because I just felt that all the way along you knew that this was something that was you know, almost mystical, that you were on some sort of special journey. And I just was there for that one day and I got a brief glimpse into, mm -hmm. into what you were experiencing. Yeah, well, I always, I still find it actually very emotional to talk about it, even this long distance <laughs> afterwards. You know, I do find it hard because um, he, he was such a special horse and, uh, and you just kept pinching yourself and saying, God, you know, I'm very lucky to have this fellow and it's such a... Of course, such a, a responsibility to have him too that, that nothing you know you'd want to avoid anything going wrong, um, and it was an anxious time in the run up to the the arc. But um, yeah, look at he was he was just such a, you know one of the greats, and and uh, he was on the verge of doing something remarkable if he if he could win the arc as well as all those races because I'm old enough to remember Nijinsky who was unbeaten losing the arc beaten by a, an inferior horse so it's always can be a tricky race and then look at what happened afterwards it was it turned out a bit yeah. tricky for him um, so uh, yeah, I was. I was. Uh, I'm sure I was emotional uh, even a week before the race I mean, you, you look at it and you say, look, he can't lose. You know, he's the best <laughs> horse in the race. He's, he's head and shoulders above everything. Sure, he, he, you know, you'll have to win. But as you get close, closer to the race, you start to see all, uh, all sorts of uh, things that could go wrong. And um, 
and they very nearly did. Here is Bayid now, asked the big question on the outside. Bayid cutting the back, Modern Games putting up a fight, but Bayid, oh, this horse has got gears that other horses do not possess, and it's night from night! Bayid and a canter! Bayid still being held on to by Jim Crowley, but now entering unknown territory trip-wise. Mishrib trying to expose any cracks in Bayid, who is now shaken up to go after Mishrib. Mishrib has the advantage. Bayid draws alongside and for the first time puts his head in front. York crescendos as Bayid moves clear from Mishrib. The Judmont International will go to Bayid up in trip. The same ruthless brilliance, a perfect 10. Not the same pressures, I know, but it must give you a fantastic satisfaction to see what a great stallion it is as well, because not every great horse turns out a great stallion. He's been marvellous. He's had classic winners, he's had horses over, well, everywhere, here, France, everywhere. And obviously he's got by now, but he'd been, he'd been a, a superb stallion to back up a great career. Yes, he has, he has. We're delighted to see that, you know, that gives us a lot of pleasure. And, um, because, you know, it's not guaranteed that great no. horses will be great stallions, but, uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, a great stallion and Frankel is a great stallion, you know, so it's, it's kind of reassuring, isn't mm -hmm. it, that mm -hmm. uh, when horses are that good and they have the looks and the pedigree to back it up, that they're not freaks in some way, so that they, it's, it's, it's reassuring that they can turn out to be uh, such good stallions and it's hard to for any stallion uh, to get to sire a horse that can be spoken of in the same breath uh, like he has with Baid, because um, you know generally great horses can't. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as Tony Morris, you know, when he was writing in the Racing Post, used to say, uh, they they revert to the mean. Mm -hmm. You know the mares aren't as good as the mm -hmm. stallion in terms of racing ability. So obviously the produce then mm -hmm. should should be somewhere in the middle. Mm. Uh, but in Baid's case he's got you know he's got a real a real cracker, you know. So that gives us great pleasure. It gives us uh, something. And this year uh, he now for the first time, of course he has daughters at Stud mm -hmm. and he's the dam sire of two group one winners now, Onesto and uh, and Eldar Eldarov won the mm. St Ledger who was out of a Sea the Stars yeah. Mare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in Venice, the, the racing aspect, you know, we've covered a great deal, but there were a couple of things and a, a couple of people. Uh, Steve was doing his research, did it by candlelight, as <laughs> his tradition now. No, but uh, one interesting point about the riders. Well, you've touched on them a number of times anyway, but you have, I don't know exactly how many grade ones and group ones, but anyway, many. Something uh, about three quarters of them, or certainly a large percentage of them, were ridden either by Johnny e. Murta or Mick Canal, and I wonder what your reflection on them, do they bring different things to you or they, were there similarities? Uh, well they're both, uh, the similarity is of course they're both great jockeys uh, who, who, who uh, were great on the big occasions. They were also just as good at the, on a Monday, uh, on a Tuesday somewhere else, but they were, where they really came into their own were on the big days because they both had that uh, determination and uh, bit of steel in them uh, to, to cope with the big days and the big races and uh, will to win is, is, you know, I mean, what, what, what makes one jockey more successful than another, you know, the, I mean, they all may, might have a similar style, they push the same way, they, you know, physically what do they do, but uh, it's, it's, um, I've said it before, uh, my father used to give me plenty of books to read, but the first one he gave me was um, Gordon Richards' autobiography. And uh, near the end of it, uh, he said, you know, he wasn't a stylish jockey mm. uh, you know, by any means, so what was he doing? And he said, people ask me, you know, how come I was so good? How come I rode so many winners? And he says, I don't really know, he says, but if I was to put my finger on one thing, I'd say it was will to win. Uh, and horses feel that. Jockeys can transmit the will to win. Um, 
and it must be true. I mean, what is it about some, some jockeys that have it a bit more, that horses, people say horses run for them. Well, they run for them because they feel something through the reins from the rider. And they both had that. I mean, Johnny used to thrive on the big days, you know, he'd be, you know, he'd be full of confidence mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, determination. And uh, Michael had it as well, you know, very calm under pressure. And and Michael would probably have a, a more quiet confidence than Johnny. Yes, yeah, John, Johnny would let you know how <laughs> confident he was. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, told me two days before the arc uh, when he was riding Cinder. He won by, he'd win by three lengths, he'd win by three lengths. Uh, don't think he quite got the three lengths. Uh, we could never say that, although he did say to me two days before the arc again, when See the Stars did his last blow, he said, this fellow's getting better. He's, you know, he's he's better than he has been all year. Um, but that it, he wouldn't say much else. Uh, but yes, that that's it really. I think their 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 will to win and their determination. And Michael was very. Um, Johnny had some ups and downs in his life. Uh, Michael was dead steady the whole way, and uh, you know there was never there could be an odd bit of drama with Johnny, uh, which he's coped with very well. He's a, a credit to himself and all his family the way he has uh, uh, conducted himself and blossomed, uh, not just as a writer but now as a trainer. Uh, there were never any issues at all with Michael. <laughs> he was very straightforward and no hiccups at all along the way, but. Uh, yeah, I was lucky, wasn't I? We're lucky to have them. Mm -hmm. Lucky to have great, great jockeys. Can I just ask one thing? One more thing about See the Stars was: Have you ever played out in your own mind what would have happened had he stayed in training for one more season? Does that ever? Well, I don't know. I think his trainer would have had a nervous breakdown <laughs> anyway, uh, because. Uh, but no, I haven't thought too much about it. Um, I thought you might ask me. Did uh, I ever think about the Breeders' Cup? A lot of people ask me that. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been something else. Mm, yeah, well, you know, it was. I think Guy Harwood, of course, who had the great Dancing Brave, I think he regrets going for the Breeders' Cup. That it was, wow. it was the one, and he had a similar. There's another horse, uh, like like many of the greats. He was campaigned aggressively. Mm -hmm. Look at how well they did with him. The great horse. They, they, he ran as many times as. See the stars, but he he had that one one last one that uh, where he got beaten. But you wouldn't run see the stars in a Breeders' Cup race at that time because of uh, the medicated horses that he'd have to take on. Uh, and I'm delighted to see now that the good guys are finally winning, and they're tidying everything up with the Horse Race Integrity Act and all that. You know. As you say, good guys, John. When we were coming to Ireland to interview you, Steve and I obviously telling people why we're coming over here. Across the board, every single person that we met, uh, when we told them we were coming to interview John Knox, they all said, a gentleman and one of racing's good guys. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit here with you, uh, reflect on all the, all the great horses you train. Uh, and I know uh, you get emotional about it, but uh, it was wonderful to see the to see the emotion and, and feel the memories of the mighty sea the stars uh, above all else. Uh, thank you for having us here today. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.